Alrighty, everybody, welcome to WCNC Charlotte's Off the Clock with Carboni podcast. I am your host, WCNC Charlotte Sports Director Nick Carboni, and this is our weekly chat and conversation with somebody who lives in Charlotte, is from Charlotte, or who has anything to do with Charlotte sports to tell their story and also dive into some sports stories that are going on in Charlotte right now. We've done this every week. Uh, For the last couple of months, it's been fantastic. We started off with our own Eugene Robinson, former NFL safety, who came on and played the saxophone. We talked to Charlotte Knights manager and Gastonia native Wes Helms, who told us about keeping the younger Chicago White Sox ready in case they were needed for the big league club in this shortened season. And now they have made the playoffs. And we've got all those conversations where we're going to have this one on YouTube. If you can see me right now, you're watching. Or if you're listening exclusively with the audio, it's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher, any basically any way you get your podcast, you can find this one. Uh, so okay, so this week we've got Paul Biancardi. He is ESPN's national recruiting director for boys basketball. He's also the lead analyst for the ESPN High School Showcase series on all the ESPN networks, and uh, he works a number of college basketball games throughout the season as well. He lives right here in Charlotte. Kind of landed here a dozen years ago. Loves it. Doesn't plan to leave. And he can do a lot of his recruiting from here. And obviously right now he can do it from home. So we're going to talk about scouting from home, what recruiting from home is like for a lot of these players and coaches. And we're also going to dive deep into the Charlotte Hornets draft. They've got the number three pick. Their lottery luck has finally turned. So we're going to start on the clock with a couple of quick questions for Paul Biancardi. All right, Paul, what is the last place you got takeout in the city of Charlotte? The last place I got takeout in the city of Charlotte would be Mario's. It's right here in Weddington. Delicious Italian. You would appreciate it. <laughs> we got to stick together down here, Paul. Okay. Who is the best high school recruit you've ever seen as a scout, analyst, or coach? LeBron James. We'll get into that. How many players are you trying to keep tabs on at any given time across the country? Well, I start at thousands and I whittle it down to hundreds and eventually we get down to a top 100. But to get to a top 100, you have to go through almost a thousand different names. Wow. All right, Paul, let's settle into this thing here. You're settled here in Charlotte now. Um, so what has it been like for, for a Northeastern guy like yourself to live down in the Carolinas? And, and you've kind of been here for a while now. How long have you been here? I've been here 12 years, Nick. Uh, spent about 35 years or so in Boston, Massachusetts, where I grew up, native Bostonian, very proud of that. Uh, Spent 10 years in Ohio, Columbus and Dayton combined, a year in St. Louis, and now Charlotte. And I'll tell you what, Charlotte came at the right time. I I love the weather down here. We have four seasons, but winter is not too long. It's the shortest one. Shortest one, I love the fall. I love the, uh, the, the springtime here, it's great. Summer's a little hot. But um, that's when you go back to New England, I guess, during the summertime when you're not working. But I love the people. I I love the landscape, the atmosphere. I love the vibe. I love Uptown and uh, big Hornets fan and Panthers fan. But Patriots come first and the Celtics take priority. Yeah, we'll see how they do. This this will air after. uh, Hopefully they'll they'll bring the series back to life a little bit. Paul, what is it like for you and your job right now? You've got the great home set up. Uh, I'm sure that's improving all the time, but how often are you able to get out to events compared to what you normally are? Oh, it's not even close. I've only been out twice in the last six months. Wow. And everything else that I've done, Nick, has been, you know, virtual. Watching events because a lot of the event organizers are, are streaming their events. So you get a chance to watch players, games throughout the day. Like I'll sit at home on a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and watch an entire event you know, take my notes and, and put them into uh, my database. But now at the same time, there's four or five other events going on throughout the country. I miss those. I watch yeah. those on demand. So instead of watching maybe the Sopranos or Suits or something like that, I'm watching events on demand during the week. Do you get more out of the, the process? Do you get less out of it than you would? I mean, we're all kind of looking at this time at our jobs and saying, okay, what did this bring about that's good? And what do I want to get back to? That's a great question, Nick, because I've discussed this with college coaches a bunch recently. There's nothing like a live event to scout because you see the, the athleticism, which you really can't see on film. You, you see the body language. You, when you see a play happen, you can see something before the play 
you see during the play, and then you see the reaction of the coaches and players after the play. Uh, there's nothing like live scouting. A virtual scouting is a great supplement to live scouting, uh, but that's all we have right now. So what you can get out of it is skill level, basketball IQ, uh, but you really miss that face-to-face -face, uh, interpersonal uh, communication. I love to see guys, Nick, after a game. Yeah. You know, if they lost, but they had a great game, are they happy? Yeah. That's not good. Did they have a bad game, but their team won? And they're pretty happy. I like that because now winning is important. So, so many things you can pick up on live scouting that you can't pick up on film, but film is the next best thing. And it's been terrific so far. It's, it's been a lot of film, but thank goodness we have it. So you kind of alluded to what I was going to ask you at some point, but I'll just bring it up now. When you have two prospects that just say they're evenly matched, they're both the same height, the same weight, the same position, the same skill set. What then becomes the separator for you in the rankings? Well, that's easy. It's character traits. I, I have a list of character traits that I look at uh, for every single player that I'm thinking about ranking. And, you know, you go all the way from, you know, work ethic and intensity and focus to respect, kindness. Uh, what kind of teammate is he? What's his body language like? Is he coachable? Does he have a teachable spirit? Or is he just a know-it-all type of guy? You know, the player can stop, I'm sorry, the person can stop the player, the talent from being great. So when you see that great player, he's usually has some really high level, high character traits that, you know, you have to go below the surface to find out. You have to see these guys live and in person. Uh, sometimes you spend time with them at the hotel. A little things like watching, you know, layup lines before the game. Uh, seeing them in restaurants. There's a lot of interaction that I have with these players. I speak to them on the phone. I do these type of Zoom calls. And uh, so the more I get to know about a player, uh, the more that can help or hinder mm -hmm. his ranking. And the coaches are looking for the same things. I mean, you're tuned into that. All right. At the beginning, when I asked you who the best high school basketball player you ever saw was, it was LeBron James. So I know you spent a lot of time as a coach in that Ohio, Ohio Valley area. Was it when you were recruiting for colleges or were you already an analyst? And tell me about the first time you saw him and, and what stood out. I was an assistant coach at Ohio State in the uh, late 90s. So when we got the job, we go out and look at the best you know, seniors that were in Ohio at that time and throughout the country, but obviously wanted to recruit the state of Ohio real well. So after we went through the seniors and juniors, we found this uh, freshman named LeBron James. People said you should go out to see him play in Akron, Ohio. Uh, we did that. And uh, you saw the talent immediately. You saw a passion for the game. I saw somebody who could really pass the ball extremely well at a young age and handle it. And his athleticism was just on that cusp a freaky as a freshman. Uh, then you go back to see him play multiple times, had him on campus once or twice to look at Ohio State. And then by the time he started his junior season, Nick, you know, the rumblings came out. Right. You know, he's going to go to the NBA. He's going to be a lottery pick. Uh, then it got to be a conversation of, well, he could be the number one pick in the draft. And people were saying, no way, not a high school senior. And the conversation got heavier and heavier. I had a lot of communication and contact with NBA scouts who said, basically, you know, save your gas, save your postage stamps. You know, you don't have to send them any more letters. You don't have to go out to see them anymore. But we're going to draft him. And we're going to draft him at the number one spot. And at that point in time, you know, you don't, you don't want to recruit against the NBA. You're not going to win. Must have been amazing to see LeBron up close at a young age. And, you know, guys might be able to jump from high school to NBA in just a few more years. That kind of got tabled when coronavirus hit, but it was certainly looking that way. All right, for the second half of the podcast, this is where we dive in to the Hornets drafting at number three. There's a lot of talented guys out there. A lot of people think Anthony Edwards, the wing player from Georgia, might be the consensus number one, but there's not that much separation. There's also point guard LaMelo Ball, Lonzo's little brother, and yes, LaVar's son. He's been playing overseas for a few years. And really intriguing guy, seven foot one center, James Wiseman, who played a little bit at Memphis, but was one of the top recruits in the country before that. So Paul certainly knows him well. Talk about a couple other guys, and uh, we'll continue this conversation right now with Paul Biancardi. 
You know, they got real lucky in the, in the NBA lottery and that was long overdue. So they've got the number three pick. Is there a clear cut number one in this draft? Is Anthony Edwards the guy? Because I've seen mocks from pretty good outlets that say, no, he might fall to three at the Hornets. Well, I've seen all these guys, LaMelo Ball, James Wiseman, Anthony Edwards. That's who we're discussing here for the uh, number one pick. Those are the top three talents, in my opinion, in the draft. I don't think there's a lot of separation. I don't think there's a clear cut choice. There's nobody that's head and shoulders above anybody else, but they all bring all-star ability. Uh, they all bring excellent positional size and, and guys that should be all-stars in this league and, and difference makers. I think, you know, they all have yellow flags per se. Nobody has a red flag. So yeah. you just got to get this one right. Uh, if you're number one and, and these are the type of players, Nick, that, if you're not making the playoffs, you get one of these guys and hopefully you make the playoffs. But if you're Golden State, we'll say, they're at number two. They may be looking for a guy that, you know, with their roster coming back, they're, they're going to be in playoff. the playoffs. Yeah, yeah they're going to be in the playoffs. They, they think they can make a deep run. Maybe this is a guy who can get them to the finals or, or be a piece that helps them win it all next year. So there, there's different needs for different teams. Tell me about Anthony Edwards. He's a Southeastern kid, went to Georgia. Uh, just to me, just jumps off with the athleticism and his just ability to, to be versatile. He's an offensive monster. That's all I can tell you. I watched Anthony Edwards since he was a sophomore in high school. I mean, right now he has a, a body of an NBA five-year veteran, right? He's strong. <laughs> he's physical. Uh, he's got to lose a little bit of that baby fat, but he can put points on the board, and, and we know the Hornets need offense. Anthony Edwards, not consistent in his one year at Georgia. You know, he has some concerns. Uh, his defensive ability is, is not there at all. Most guys are not. Even when you look at guys from high school to college, you know, yeah. they're getting recruited and ranked mostly because of their offensive ability, not because of their defense. Though there are some guys that are a defensive uh, savants in this draft and guys that are defensive uh, priority coming out of high school, going to college. But Anthony Edwards... He's tremendous on one side of the ball right now. and If you need points, he can deliver it in a variety of ways. Not great from the three-point line, but you know he's more than capable. And, uh, James Wiseman, a guy we saw limited action of in Memphis, a guy that you know really excites a lot of people, and, and some people might not want the Hornets to draft a, a seven-footer. So what are you getting when you get a James Wiseman in the draft? Well, there's nobody else like him in the draft. Um, you know, you look at his measurables, they're off the charts, right? 7'1", seven, 7'5", seven, wingspan. And Nick, he's got a 9-foot, 6-inch standing reach, which means without <laughs> leaving the ground, you know, he's 4 yeah. inches from the rim. Yeah. Uh, this guy is a, a franchise-changing center, and uh, I think he's a guy that can really help a team in terms of shot-blocking ability, running the floor. He's got a dependable, legitimate jump hook with his left hand over his right shoulder. And he's got a move. He's got a go-to move for a big right now with his back to the basket. He's a better shooter, Nick, than people know about. We had him as the number one player in the high school game. And I got a chance to see him in practice a lot, in workouts a lot. And I know he can shoot the ball better than people have seen or better than people know about. He's got an elbow jump shot right now. I watched him knock down high school threes in workouts. So I know he's yeah. more than capable. But because of his short time at Memphis, uh, the three games, you know, he didn't get a chance to really show much offense. I know they had some workouts and practices, but when those NBA scouts go to those workouts and practices, the coaches, the college coaches are putting those guys like in the best position to do the things that they do best. You know, James Wiseman running the floor, blocking shots, scoring inside, great screener, dive, dunk guy. So I, I think he's, an exceptional talent in this draft. Great upside. Yeah, would certainly fit in with, with the Hornets' needs. All right, there's a lot of mystery about Wiseman. There's not so much mystery about LaMelo Ball. Uh, to me, he is just, you know, the complete package when you talk about his size and, and his position at guard. Um, a lot of people are probably still, you know, have the, the voice of LeVar in their head. I mean, is he kind of still attached to this kid uh, when he gets drafted by a team? And, and what else can you tell us about this guy who, who played overseas the last few years? I watched him since he was a freshman at Chino Hills. And what's so impressive uh, about LaMelo Balnick, 
I mean, he's been a professional twice already. Yeah. So you know he can handle the NBA game, the bright lights. He's battle-tested. And you mentioned it. You talked about his ability is, is off the charts. I mean, he's an elite playmaker with elite positional size. He's close to 6'7 right now. He reminds me in many ways offensively of a Jason Kidd and a Penny Hardaway. He's that good of a playmaker. The things he does, you just can't coach. You asked about the dad, LeVar Ball. I mean, yes, he is attached because he is his father. Uh, I think LaMelo probably took a good look at what happened between uh, Zoe and his dad. So hopefully avoid those mistakes. Uh, LaMelo Ball is, is much a much bigger talent than his father's distractions. Yeah. And uh, I think you have to look at that when drafting. I wouldn't pass on LaMelo Ball because of LaVar, but I would set some boundaries and some policies with him. So, uh, you know, the franchise could get the best out of his son. And so his son could be the best version of himself. Uh, the best sheer talent in the draft uh, is LaMelo Ball. All right. Uh, and, and you know what? Lonzo's kind of out, outshined that that shadow, so to speak, too. He's become a pretty good pro, too. Uh, let's just, you know, wrap it up. A wild card, maybe an Obi Toppin coming in here. What, what can uh, this guy from Dayton do? He can really shoot it. I mean, he's a big who can pick and pop. He can make that dribble handoff and then separate for a jumper. You know, he's today's modern power forward guy who can shoot the ball. A really good, I mean, vertical athlete. He can get up quick. He can get to the Elbows above the rim. I, I love his game, and I love his story, Nick. He, he's battle-tested, right? He's a redshirt sophomore. That means he's been in college for three years, and he did it at the University of Dayton. We don't know how he would have dominated maybe the NCAA tournament. We never got a look at that. But he dominated college basketball with his offense, his passing, his shooting, his vertical ability, can rebound the ball as well. He's that power forward in today's game that, that can really stretch out the floor. And he really came from, you know, he came, he's from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, yeah. He came from obscurity. You know, he didn't go to the traditional high schools. He didn't go through the, the regular process. He wasn't ranked, uh, mm -hmm. but he worked his tail off because the coaches at Dayton saw a lot in him. And I think that one year, Nick, that one year that he redshirted at Dayton, which means you don't play games, but you work yeah. on your body and you work on your skill. And you, you learn the lay of the land of college basketball. That was a tremendous uh, year for OB Top, and I think that made him the player that he is today. Paul, last question about one last guy that I, the Hornets will not be picking at three, but I think will be a first-round pick, and a guy that I loved watching play high school basketball here in Charlotte at Providence Day, Devon Dotson, point guard out of Kansas. Uh, where do, you, do you think he's a first-round pick, and, and what can he bring to an NBA team? I think he's on that cusp of late first, early second. I'm not sure he's going to be a first round pick, but he brings, first of all, big time winner. You mentioned it at Providence Day High School. He won big, went to Kansas. And as the, as the point guard in the spotlight for Bill Self, he delivered in a big time way. He's a winner. He's a leader. He's got great speed, tremendous on ball defender. The jump shot is a question, but his heart, his toughness, his defense, and his leadership is not. Uh, he'll, he'll make an NBA team for sure, and he'll be in the NBA for a long time. Really good athlete, really strong for his size. And as you mentioned, a local guy that I know we both root for. Yeah, absolutely. And he'll be joining Grant Williams in the NBA. Man, I would have loved to see what he could have done with that Kansas team in the tournament, but wasn't meant to be. Paul Biancardi, thank you so much for joining Off the Clock. And uh, good luck the rest of the way here. The home setup looks great. I got to get one of those jerseys with my handle in it as well, man. You're, you're killing the game with that. Yeah, I got to get one of those lights that you have, though, that, that white ring light, so I get a little better light in here. But the jersey, that's going to stay on the wall. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Paul. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the Off the Clock with Carboni podcast. Again, if you don't mind, hit follow or subscribe, however you're watching or listening. We'd really appreciate that, and we will drop these, as usual, every Friday. Until then, you can catch me on WCNC Charlotte at 6 and 11 on weeknights, also Sunday nights now, and this Sunday night we got a big one, Sunday night football between the Packers and Saints. We'll be talking Panthers after that one. Hopefully they can take down the Chargers. See you then.